As the four main engines shut down, the crew of the Conspiracy Aurora settled in for the long haul towards their destination. It would be far from a quiet trip, however. Small, regular course correction burns would have to be performed at different intervals during the trip to ensure the ship arrived at Jewel on the proper heading. There was another issue as well. Astrodynamics had calculated that, while the Conspiracy Aurora had enough fuel to enter Jewel orbit and land on Lathe, it did not have enough to return home on top of that. Thankfully, lessons learned on the mission to Drez meant engineers on the ground had planned for such an eventuality by sending a refueling probe named Artemis to Jewel not long after the departure of the Conspiracy, making use of a Juno gravity assist to ensure that it arrived at Jewel only a few months after the main vessel. The crew was extensively trained in how to rendezvous and dock with this probe in Jewel orbit, meaning the lack of fuel did not bother them for a single second during their flight to Jewel. However, they were not told that, due to yet more funding cuts, if Artemis failed, they would be on their own. Completely oblivious to this fact, the crew of the Conspiracy Aurora were in high spirits as they hurtled towards their target, watching intently as Artemis was rolled out onto the pad at the KSC. I'm sorry guys, it's yet another launch that I'm bringing you in this episode. I promise, I hope, that this will be the final one. But guys, welcome back to episode, another episode should I say, of Operation Shamrock Dawn. This is a very, very busy episode. We have a lot of stuff to cram in in this one sort, in this one uh, 18 minute or so time frame that I have for you guys. We're beginning of course with the launch of the Artemis refueling vessel. Um, this is going to make use, as I said in the intro, of a Juno gravity assist to get to Jewel and save a little bit of fuel because obviously every drop of fuel counts when getting this thing into, um, into a Julian orbit, shall we say. We did have a few minor problems with the launch. First of all, I think I took too flatter of a trajectory than I perhaps should have um, on the ascent here. You can see it perhaps turned over a little earlier than I perhaps should have been. It stayed a little too long in the atmosphere and we did go into a little bit of a spin earlier uh, higher up in the atmosphere but although that didn't really matter too much um, as it turned out we managed to get our assist and everything just fine and I'll show you it uh, when I actually do come to it. But this is when we arrive at Jewel. This is basically the most beautiful episode I think I've made of any series ever. Trust me when we eventually get the Conspiracy Aurora um, arriving at Jewel once we tweaked all of its encounters and everything. Seriously, there are a few screenshot moments. I'm literally pausing for screenshots literally every five seconds just because of the beauty of the Julian system. I want to take a couple of minutes just while we watch the uh, the Artemis just tumbling into orbit there. Um, I, it's plucky, the Artemis. I think it's going to be with this plucky little ship that uh, is going to be missed when we have to ditch it and leave it behind, but I digress. I just want to take a moment to talk about the the mod which I'm using. It is the Astronomer's Visual Pack with a few tweak configs where I'm not and where I got them from. I'm not too sure. It was from a YouTube video of some kind, and everything just looks beautiful. It's of course got distant object enhancement and um, well, I think this the the completely black sort of space um, is part of distant object enhancement as well and as well as planet shine. It just looks gorgeous. And you can see here, I have actually edited out a lot of the maneuver nodes and stuff like that just for time's sake, really. This whole thing would, if, if I hadn't have edited this stuff out, would have been over an hour long. And I don't want to, I don't want to release an hour-long video to you guys because no one wants, wants to watch that. Not even the most hardcore nerd of Kerbal Space Program wants to watch an hour-long video of me just basically making a circle get more elliptical. It's not fun. It's really not fun, especially when you're having to play it in real time at like 12 frames per second maximum. Um, I did have a few memory problems, including a crash, one of which was just about here. Um, a few seconds after I got this Juno encounter, and you can see me here um, preparing the final things for that Juno encounter, this fade out here, it crashed, and subsequently, 
I forgot to press record again when I was tweaking my encounter with the Conspiracy Aurora for Jewel. Um, but I managed to get closer to Jewel than I was um, when I wasn't recording before I realised, oh, sh go shoot, I need to start recording again. And um, I, I just managed to start tweaking the encounter a little bit further so that we did actually get a lathe encounter. Um, so that should slow us down a little bit. What I managed to do is I'm using the moons of Jewel to help us slow us down. I'm using Lathe to take some velocity off to begin with. Then I'm using a sort of retrograde Tylo encounter to try and um, kill off a lot of that velocity and sort of bring us into a highly elliptical orbit and then we can sort of go from there. But you can see here we have now switched back to the, um, the Artemis probe at Juna at its Juna gravity assist. I had to manage everything pretty um, sort of closely here um, because the manoeuvre node for the gravity assist um, for Juna in order to get the the Artemis over to Joule um, was basically a day ahead of the uh, manoeuvre node I needed to actually get the Conspiracy Aurora on the correct trajectory for Joule. It's a lot of bouncing back and forth in this video and I'm kind of kind of annoyed of how it's turned out because this was really the best way of showing it and it's all kind of a bit all over the place but you can see here we have successfully uh, completed the gravity assist and it's now en route to Joule. We then switch back to the Conspiracy Aurora in order to complete its burn uh, in order to get it on the correct trajectory to Joule. You can see here there's a lot of time, time acceleration, a lot of sort of skipping ahead and everything. Also, like I say, we run very, very low on fuel in this thing. Um, I'm trying to, I do have, like, whoa, look at the orbit go there. That's another thing that I started to notice with this craft as well. You remember me in the last episode, I said this thing turns pretty well? Well, it turns out that as it gets lighter, because, most likely because it has two full tanks of fuel right on the front of it, and t a few, like, half full tanks of fuel right at the end of it, it sort of makes the ship like a dumbbell and so as a result the whole thing in the center because it's structurally weak because it's held together by nothing more than magnetic a magnetic force and hooks um it does sort of uh, flop around a little bit and you'll see that when we actually uh, start our retrograde burn into the dual into dual orbit but you can see here we're finalizing our uh, encounter here and you can see how much the maneuver node is wobbling because of this sort of structural weakness this is something that i don't know if it's possible to fix it in ksp but I wish it could be, even if it is possible, I wish it was, and if it could be fixed, then I hope it is, if you know what I mean. That's sort of like a strange way to explain it. Um, but you can see here we're now at Apoapsis, this is the furthest out that any Kerbal has ever been before. So we just took a moment to take a screenshot of, uh, of that moment, because it is rather beautiful, and we are now closing in on the Julian system. But yeah, I really wish that that physics glitch would be fixed, if it can actually be, because it is very annoying trying to center your maneuver nodes. But anyway, we have now entered into the Julian sphere of influence and you can see me going crazy as we can see the first glimpse of Jewel and its moons. I remember when I was watching um, this thing live, I managed to see Lathe as but one pixel sort of rising over Jewel's horizon. It was really, really nice coming in from that distance. I thought it was uh, quite a cute little, cute little uh, thing to watch, even though it probably has not shown up on here because, well, it's just simply too small one pixel probably wouldn't show up. But you can see here we're now making our way down and Jewel and its moons, we get our first close-up-ish look of them slowly doing their celestial dance around one another and we get our first close-up of Lathe. Lathe is the main reason that we are here in the Julian system. It is um, our spectroscopy results, the KSC's spectroscopy results from a distance, have found that it contains an oxygen-rich atmosphere and also um, high concentrations of nitrogen as well, hence the blue colour of it. They have even found out that there could potentially be some form of liquid water on its surface, meaning that we have sent a lander that is both able to float, hopefully, and um, also able to sort of land on land even though its landing legs are very kind of squat and I think I'm going to need some form of assistance to try and get it to land. I'm going to need all the luck in the world to actually try and get it to land. Um, hopefully it should work and we'll see that in the next episode. But you can see here we're getting the lovely green glow as you just saw a second ago off of Jewel and we're coming up on our lathe gravity assist which means we get our first close up look of this interesting little moon. The only one in the Kerbal system with an atmosphere at 
this present time that we know of. And you can see as we're coming in, you can see there are clouds above the surface. This is also very intriguing. It could potentially suggest that Lathe has some form of water cycle, uh, so that the water is being evaporated by the sun's heat, or maybe even Joule's radiation, because of course Joule has very high amounts of radiation. And it could potentially be ionizing the water, maybe making ionized clouds, maybe? We just don't know. We'll have to get down there and actually do some uh, extended analysis in order to uh, in order to make sure. But oh, first things first, we have some priorities to sort out. Yeah, remember the wet noodle analogy I was using but a few minutes ago? This is why I tried to use physical time warp uh, because I was impatient, because I'm always impatient in these missions. And we end up just flopping around hopelessly. Uh, because of the excess weight at the uh, the end there, which because of the lander, which is obviously fully fueled. But we managed to activate the RCS just in time in order to sort of stabilize ourselves and then cut out the rest of the burn time for the most part because it just took so long. You can see me here just cutting out different pieces of the burn again and again and again. And this is the final few meters a second here as we were actually uh, getting our retrograde Tylo encounter in order to sort of capture us and put us into a low dual trajectory. The reason we've gone for a low dual trajectory is because we want to drop our orbiters. That is the last thing that we'll be doing in this episode before we finish off. You can see here we also get another encounter with Lathe at a, Lathe at a slightly different angle, which is what, of course, we will be using um, to uh, kick us down to a very low low altitude dual orbit to uh, put our dual orbiter into... Uh, it, uh, but it's not a dual orbiter, basically, but it's also a dual impactor. We'll put that into... Uh, will drop that into Joule's atmosphere. You can see as well some weird stuff's going on with the um, orbit calculation, the patch conics. For some reason, I have no idea why that's happening. It just seems to be happening. I think it might be a memory issue, although I'm not too sure. But you can see here we're coming up on our first close approach of Tylo. Now, this is a very interesting little moon. It's about the size of Kerbin. It has almost the same gravity, but no atmosphere. I think it's um, a analog of Ganymede, if I'm not mistaken. I might be wrong there. Um, but it is a very, very interesting little moon, and hopefully this orbiter that we're uh, releasing now, which I am about to name, I think I called it the Odysseus um, launch, um, orbiter, which of course has been given to us as a contract to release, um, we'll be able to get many closer looks at it. So you can see we finally released it and everything, until I realised, of course, that it has no fuel inside of it. Uh, this is because even though I disabled crossfeed on the little base part that it was docked to, for some reason it still the nuclear engine still managed to draw fuel from it, and so as a result the Odysseus is without any form of propulsion. Uh, so it's literally going to have to stay in the dual system, getting pinged around from gravity assists um, from Lathe and Tylo, because they're the most likely gravity assists that they're going to get. And Joule, of course, don't forget Joule. And you can see here the uh, pockmarked surface of Tylo here. It looks like a relatively dead world, but it's just so massive. Uh, so massive for such a dead world, and there is some interesting uh, mountainous regions sort of in the uh, in the northern hemisphere there I'd like to take a closer look at, if possible. But you can see we're now actually leaving Tylo behind. It'll be a story for another time. We're now coming up on a second lathe encounter. It is on that encounter we will have to, uh, have to drop our dual orbiter, which I will name Salvation. The reason I call it a Salvation is because for one time, in one of my missions, for one time, something actually went pretty damn well. And you'll see what I mean in a few minutes when we actually do come up on lathe. First though, we're just stopping to admire the scenery once again. Mad props to this mod, seriously, this um, beautification mod, Astronomer's Visuals, I think it's the interstellar variant. Just, good god. It, just look at it. it words can't, cannot describe how beautiful and realistic this thing looks, especially when you're around the Julian system. But you can see here we're now in Lathe's Sphere of Influence. We are um, releasing the Salvation uh, Probe. And initially, things didn't go all that well. So you can see here I release it and I go to activate the engine in order to do a retrograde burn in but a moment uh, to bring us a little bit closer so that we actually deep, uh, dip into Joule's atmosphere in order to slow down. Um, because obviously we don't want the main, the main ship to do that. As you'd see, as you saw with the burns earlier, it would probably break apart. 
So you can see here under lathe's influence to sort of save a bit of delta V obviously. I tried to activate the engine engine and nothing happens. Now I'm wondering why this is. I mean we have full electric charge apparently. What's going on here? And I of course remember that I'd locked off some of the batteries in case some of the electric charge did actually uh, did actually um, run out so that I'd have a spare backup. Turns out I locked out all but one of the batteries so I, all I had to do was unlock them again and I had power. Enough power to uh, activate the engine and bring us into a, a descent trajectory towards Jewel. And so here we go now we're leaving a lathe sphere of influence and we're plummeting down towards the Julian atmosphere. This is designed to measure the pressure, the composition, etc. of Jewel's atmosphere and get a look at those wispy clouds. The camera on board of this thing as well is also going to be the first and probably only vessel to ever witness a true shamrock dawn and you will see that in a few moments when we actually hit the atmosphere you can feel the tension building now as the thermal starts i start checking the thermal counter ready for when we hit the atmosphere at about 200,000 meters now you can see here we're about to hit it with you can see a lovely sight of val lathe and tylo all sort of lining up in the sky and i knew that was an omen to begin with like I say, this mission surprisingly, this part of the mission anyway, went surprisingly well. You can see here, look at the G's building up, look at the flames and the fire coming off of this thing. This thing is only very, very light and so as a result it does slow down rather quickly in the Julian atmosphere. But look at the camera shake going on here! This is insane! Um, the G's are in excess of 15 G's, it is absolutely insane, the camera shake is freaking insane. Um, but we managed to slow down and stop the actual shock heating rather quickly, to be fair. Quicker than I actually expected. I was expecting to be screaming across the, the, uh, the skies of Jewel in a fireball for I don't know how long. But we actually managed to get to the point where um, we're able to deploy the drogue chutes and nothing seems to be too much afoot. I mean, I'm able to transmit data about the temperature and everything. Um, clearly the atmosphere of Jewel is just so dense that once you get past that initial phase it slows you down so quickly that you can just descend providing your vessel is light. No problem. And of course it couldn't be complete without the uh, the the sun, the set shall we say. I think the lathe Val and Tylo are setting. The lathe Val and Tylo set in the background there. And obviously you can see here the Shamrock Dawn but this is just the uh, just the start of the Shamrock Dawn. Yes, as we descend deeper into the atmosphere, it becomes more and more clear as we dare descend beneath Jules' thick hazy clouds as well. It does look like a truly alien world. You can see here as well the camera shake is still going on rather violently at the moment, shall we say. Eventually though, I just get bored of us descending, seeing as there isn't much to see, and just cut the chutes to see what happens, and eventually we hit, we find the giant chasm of the surface below. I'm not quite sure what this is, um, but we'll have to get the R&D people um, to look at it, certainly, because it is something to, uh, to take note. You can see as we're descending, a massive hole opens up below Jewel, around 4 kilometers above the surface. Now, we're not sure what this might be, but it is very interesting. But this is going to wrap it up for this episode, guys. We will visit Lathe and land on Lathe in the next episode. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I loved it so much. Until the next one, guys, my name is Bradders. Peace out.